this is Dr. Halisa Elwine. Welcome back to our study in Creation Gospel Workbook 2. We have worked our way through the seven abominations of the wicked lamp, and now we work through the seven seals up to the sixth seal. And we're, we're camping out here for a little bit to study the four winds, because in the sixth seal, we see how the four winds are, uh, the four angels are holding back the four winds of the earth. And we related that in the last program as to the, how the encampments of the 12 tribes and their four divisions, there was a relationship there, even between how it looked on earth and then the reality of these 12 angels and these four divisions around the throne in the heavenlies. And where we left off in the last program, we, we were quoting from the prophet Hosea, who prophesies of a time when the Lion of Judah will roar from the east. Remember, Judah always took the first steps. No matter which direction the camp went, it was always going to be Judah taking the first steps. In Revelation, Yeshua is described as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the one who's going to roar and to begin to, to get the rest of the tribes to kind of snap to. Get packed up. It's time to move. Remember, as you encamp, so shall your journey be. So these 12 tribes have been scattered out there to the four winds. It's not going to be that easy to just stay in your lane. Uh, how that's going to happen remains to be seen. But this will be an even greater miracle than what we see in the wilderness where you've just got a big collection of people. It would be fairly easy to organize them into their camps and their divisions. But now the Israelites are scattered out to the 12 tribes. It's going to take King Messiah <laughs> to get these tribes sorted out. But it says that, that Judah, he, he's going to roar like a lion to get everybody started, to take those steps. This is Ephraim will come trembling from the West. Now Yeshua helps us with this. He helps us to understand beyond the 12 baskets full of the fragments of bread. He's going to get on the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to demonstrate to his 12 disciples what their role is. And uh, it's, it's going to be part of, of the Galilee. It's actually not a, a Sea of Galilee, but remember, seas represent the nations. In scripture, so saying the Sea of Galilee, it fits very well with the nickname of the area of the Galilee, which is called Galilee of the Nations. It was kind of an intersection of where the nations went through as they traveled for trade and so forth. So saying Galilee of the Nations, first century people understood that. Uh, at any rate, Yeshua is going to get into a boat on the Galilee with his disciples. So let's read Mark 4, 35 through 41. It says, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Let us cross over to the other side. Remember, when you cross over, you're being a Hebrew. A Hebrew is one who has crossed over. It says, Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly. They trembled like Ephraim coming from the west. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, remember, our four winds, they cover the four corners of the earth, we have the seas that represent the nations. So even the winds 
the spirits of Adonai that move around the world, and the sea, the nations, will obey him. But Yeshua is asleep in the boat. When the great windstorm arises, he still has not been aroused from his dormant state. That's one of the, the rabbinic understandings about the north, is that King Messiah is concealed in the north. And because King Messiah is concealed in the north, he's considered to be in a dormant state. And so when King Messiah is aroused, they believe, this is going to be the time when he will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, don't hold back. And the Ephraim will come trembling from the west. And uh, this is something specifically associated with King Messiah by the way. And so we have Yeshua asleep in the boat. He's in this dormant state, and they have to awake him. They have to rouse him. And they say, we're perishing. We're concerned. And so he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the winds, wind ceased, and there was great calm. Think again about the four angels standing at the four winds, and being told to, to hold the winds back until the bond servants are sealed. Yeshua is able to tell the winds, stop. Stop. I want to protect my 12 disciples. Well, as these 12 disciples represent the 12 tribes, and the 12 tribes represent the four corners of the earth, we can see why even the wind and the sea obeyed him. The only one who would be able to control contrary winds, winds that had completely different jobs, who can take those winds and force them to obey other than one from the throne itself? So that's what Yeshua does. He disciplines the wind when he awakes. And remember what we read in the previous program. It was an odd statement by Rabbi Elazar. He said, anyone who would say that he is God should come and complete this north wind, which I left alone, and all will know that he is God. It's saying that the Creator left something incomplete of the north wind, and anybody who would say, you know, I am the representation of the Creator. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You heard Yeshua make these sorts of statements before. And so the, the disciples say, who is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Because only King Messiah is supposed to be able to do that. And he's saying, yeah, didn't you have enough faith? If you thought I was the Messiah, I mean, isn't that why you followed me? Well, if you followed me and thought I was the Messiah, why would you think I couldn't discipline the four winds? But they did. They had to arouse him, which goes back to that, that understanding of King Messiah being concealed in the north. And it's thought that King Messiah will come from the north. He will come from the kingdom of Edom. And I know you're saying, wait a minute, Edom's in the south. Um, I did some lessons on the four beast kingdoms. And in that, we saw how Edom, yes, Edom is in Edom in the south, but yet part of Edom was transplanted into the north as the entity of Rome. It, he's called the red one now. Edom is the red one, and Rome is now called the red one. And it's thought that King Messiah will come from Edom, he will come from the north with his garment stained in blood, and then he will go south, uh, and he will build the third temple. Pretty interesting, huh? But there's more. Sounds like a great commercial, doesn't it? But wait, there's more. There's more in Genesis 28.10. Why did Yeshua have to sleep on a pillow? 
Why do we need to know that? Couldn't the, the text have just said he fell asleep in the boat? Does it have to say his head was on a pillow? Yes, it does. Let's read from Genesis 28.10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he happened upon, by the way, Haran is going to be north. He happened upon a particular place and spent the night there because the sun had set. Isn't that what Yeshua did? He gets into the boat and the sun sets. He took one of the stones of the place and made his support for his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. I wonder if those are the four angels. Ascending and descending, in other words, adjusting. Then behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. Our four winds, our four directions. And in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, The Lord is certainly in this place, and I did not know it. Pretty much what the disciples said when they awoke Yeshua from his sleep. He, he takes authority over the winds. And they said, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, this is what Jacob says. The Lord is certainly in this place, and I didn't know it. I wasn't aware of it. I had to be aroused from my sleep uh, to, to get a sense of where I was. So the promise here to Jacob was that his descendants would spread out, to, it would spread out west, east, north, and south, the four directions, the four faces of the wind. His 12 tribes, his family would be spread out like that. And then it says in verse 18, So Jacob got up early in the morning and took the stone that he had placed as a support for his head and set it up as a memorial stone and poured oil on its top. That's significant. The, the oil that he pours on its top, remember a Messiah, a Mashiach, it comes from Mashach, which means to pour oil to anoint with oil. We know Yeshua is the stone. And so Jacob pours oil on the stone. He anoints the Mashiach. He, he, it's a prophecy there. A prophecy where he's told that his descendants, the 12 tribes, will spread out to the four directions of the earth. And where it says he was asleep, uh, the King James is more exact about saying he was in the hind part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. But when we look up that Greek word there for pillow, uh, it's a compound of two Greek words, the main one being uh, G 2776. And they've matched it into the Septuagint from its Hebrew cognate. Its Hebrew cognate is rosh, for head. It's a pillow, place you put your head. Well, if we go back into the Hebrew text where it says, uh, Jacob took the stone that he had placed as a support for his head and set it up as a memorial stone and poured oil on its top, the Hebrew word used there for the pillow is uh, marosh tav. It's, it's the means of putting your head somewhere. That's the word for pillow. It's rosh too. And where did he pour the oil on the stone? It says rosha on its head. So twice in that verse, we get the word rosh. 
And then when we see Yeshua asleep, his head is on the rosh. It's on the pillow. He's helping us to understand how even though the four winds scattered the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the four corners of the earth, nevertheless, through him, through Messiah Yeshua, they will return in peace to the place where the pillow was. The place where the pillow was was Beit El, the house of God. And there's even a midrash to Song of Songs 117. It says that that stone pillow that, that Jacob put his head on says it became like a bed filled with feathers beneath him. And in the Song of Songs, that verse says that our bed is full of vigor. And that's taken to mean that Yeshua, again, is the one who's going to be able to draw back in Jacob's descendants. He's going to fill it with vigor. He's going to fit, fulfill with resurrection power this promise to recall the, the 12 tribes who were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And now this pillow bed, this pillow full of feathers, it's going to begin to produce fruits. Jacob is on his way to find a wife. And he's going to marry, and he's going to produce 12 sons who produce the 12 tribes, which again recalls the 12 fruits for every month in the holy city of the Lamb. And so with this pillow or this bed pillow, we get the idea that, yes, Jacob is on his way north. He's going to be hidden in the north for a while, just like King Messiah. But, you know, in this dark place of concealment, somehow he's going to multiply. He's going to be fruitful. And uh, I, I found a, a little blurb in the Midrash talking about the feathers from this soft pillow bed. It says, and in a midrash, you're not supposed to take it literally, by the way. It's a teaching tool to help you process something. It says, this soft pillow bed became cedar and cypress from Song of Songs 117, where it says, the beams of our houses are cedars, our panels, cypresses. Where Jacob is going is north. He's traveling north across Lebanon that is known for its cypresses and cedars. He's going to go to the north. He's going to father 13 children, 12 sons for 12 tribes. And the Midrash says that these cypresses and cedars that it's talking about are righteous men and women, prophets and prophetesses who arose from Jacob's 12 tribes. And they are called the cedars and the cypresses of the house, the house being the temple. So they are kind of like the bones of the temple, the righteous men and women, the descendants of Jacob. And the cypresses and the cedars of Lebanon, which is where they sourced the wood for the temple. Remember King Solomon, he made a deal with King Hiram. Well, the cedars and the cypresses, they became the bones of the house of the temple. They have a country cousin. These, these magnificent cypresses and cedars of Lebanon in the north. In the south, out in the Midbar, where they built the Mishkan, the tabernacle, they used acacia wood in the Midbar. It's a much smaller country cousin to the cypresses and cedars, but they're all in the same family. So the same way that the, the lowly acacia was part of the bones of the Mishkan, in the same way the, the, the mighty prophets and prophetesses of Israel are going to become part of the bones of the house in this prophecy. Um, and just like we found out in the wilderness, obedience can bring peace to the four winds. But rebellion, it can bring bewilderment, it can bring chaos, it can bring misdirection. 
misdirection. So we're learning a lot about the four winds. We're learning more about prophecy as it concerns Jacob and his, his 12 tribes. We're learning more about Yeshua as it concerns how he interacts with his 12 disciples. Um, still, we're looking back at those four angels who are holding back the four winds. I want to give you a, a, at least one more example of how this divine machine works, where Israel is supposed to obey its covenant and be in a close relationship with the Holy One, and then that in turn brings blessing to the faces, to the directions assigned to them. So in the Gemara, Tani 3b, it says, Are they not withheld? And he will close up the heavens. And this is a commentary on Deuteronomy eleven seventeen. They say this means that God will stop up the heavens from the clouds and the winds. Do you say that close up the heavens means from the clouds and from the winds? Or perhaps it is only referring to the absence of rainfall. When the same verse says, so that there will be no rain. And remember, this is being prophesied in Deuteronomy eleven seventeen as a consequence for breaking the covenant. There will be no rain. He says, so that there will be no rain. Rain is already mentioned explicitly. How then do I uphold the meaning of the verse and he will close up the heavens? It's like two different things. He says, this must mean he'll close up the heavens from the clouds and from the winds. So again, the clouds are part of that divine machine. The clouds of glory surrounding the throne, they interact with the camp of Israel. And they work, they're, they're primed, the clouds are primed with obedience. And this is how Israel is to be a light to the nations. This blessing can fall on the nations. They can be that light to the nations, and the nations will become very concerned with what the tribes are doing. The nations will need the tribes to remain in good covenant relationship with heaven. Ultimately, disobedience causes heaven to close off the clouds of blessing. Obedience releases them. Disobedience will put the, the four winds into chaos. But obedience will bring peace. So, let's go back to our passage. We've spent a lot of time talking about these four angels and four winds. Let's review it to see if it makes better sense now. Now that we know something about the four winds and the four angels and the 12 tribes, let's see if this reads a little bit easier. So Revelation 7, 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, that would be the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Who can the angels harm if they turn the winds loose? The earth and the sea. Remember, the sea represents the nations. Saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees. And trees also represent people, by the way until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Right, in the same way that we are to understand the encampments in the Torah portion by Midbar and how the tribes were to affect the nations at the four winds, now we can see this reinforced in Revelation chapter 7. And when we see this angel coming from the rising of the sun, it's coming from the east, and it's thought that the most damaging heat comes from the east wind. 
And again, as we continue going through Revelation, we'll look at the work of the supernatural bugs from Abaddon. One of the characteristics of these bugs is not just that they sting, but it's like burning. It's associated with smoke. There's going to be scorching heat. This scorching heat, this plague of heat that comes with it, remember the most damaging is going to come from the east. And this message coming from the rising of the sun from the east apparently is getting ready to activate once the bond servants, once the encampments are sealed. From there, it looks like the angels are just going to let go. It doesn't appear that they're going to try to manipulate for good the way that those four winds blow. At this point, they're just holding them still, like nothing move right now. Well, once they let them go, it seems like there's no attempt to even move them in a, in a way that's not harmful. It's just like they completely let them go at the same time, which we know if you let all four winds blow at the same time, if there is no prevailing wind, if there's just four winds, not necessarily competing, but just randomly interacting with one another, you're creating the most horrific weather event of all time. In fact, uh, as it concerns these four angels, the sages believe that these four angels are also assigned to the four kingdoms. And you say, which four kingdoms? If you'll remember, there's four kingdoms of the beast that Daniel sees and that John sees. They have that in common. The four beast kingdoms are Babylon, which had the golden head. He's also represented by a lion. You have Persia Medea, uh, which is the silver kind of chest area of the beast. Um, that's going to be represented, I believe, by a bear. Then you have Greece, which is more of this bronze uh, lower torso. That's represented by the leopard. And then the legs, the iron legs, are Rome. Those are the four primary beast kingdoms. Now, if you'd like to know more about where did these four beast kingdoms come from, uh, there is a study on my YouTube channel, and it's, I believe, called Muddy Bloody Puddles. Muddy Bloody Puddles. That's it. Try saying it three times. Muddy Bloody Puddles. But it breaks down these four uh, beast kingdoms, and it shows how the serpent, which is Pharaoh, the crocodile of the Nile, the Tanin, associated with Leviathan, how that serpent traveled to Babylon. And then at that point, he was out of his element. Uh, the serpent is more of a sea creature. That's where his power is. In order to wreak chaos on Israel, which was separated from Egypt, this particular Pharaoh, he travels to Babylon and he makes battle and he loses. So this serpent Pharaoh, that authority, just like it says in Revelation, how the serpent gives his authority to the beast, this Pharaoh gives his authority to the king of Babylon. And then the four kingdoms that, that take root in the earth after that are basically part of the same entity. You can see in Nebuchadnezzar, after Daniel uh, explains his dream to him, about how there would just be a golden head of his kingdom, rather than accept that prophecy, the king of Babylon turns around and creates a whole image of himself entirely in gold, thinking, if I can get all the nations, he calls them in, to bow down and worship me, I can extend my kingdom through all time. Instead, he passes on to Persia Medea, some elements, Persia Medea passes on to Alexander the Great, some elements, Alexander passes on to Rome. And in the end, 
It's one image of the beast. <laughs>